Griffin and Sabine, An Extraordinary Correspondence, by Nick Bantock. Griffin Moss, it's good to get in touch with you at last. Could I have one of your fish postcards? I think you were right. The wine glass has more impact than the cup. Sabine Strohem. Sabine, thank you for your exotic postcard. Forgive me if it's a memory lapse on my part, but should I know you? I can't fathom out how you were aware of my first broken cup sketch for this card. I don't remember showing it to anyone. Please, enlighten me. Yours, Griffin Moss. Griffin Moss. No, Griffin. You don't know me. Not in the way you mean. Though I've been watching your art for many years. Having finally established who and where you are, I feel compelled to reveal myself. The phenomenon that links us has taught me much about you, yet I'm ignorant of your history. Please tell me something of your life. It is such a pleasure having your images in a tangible form. I really like the kangaroo in the hat, but I wonder whether you should have darkened the sky. Sabine. Ms. Stroham, what's going on? How in the world could you know I darkened the sky behind the kangaroo? It was only a light cobalt for about half an hour. And what do you mean by phenomenon and tangible? Okay, if getting me intrigued is what you're after, you've succeeded, but you can hardly expect me to spill my life story to a stranger. Why are you being so ruddy mysterious? Griffin Moss. P.S. Your postcards are handmade. Did you do them yourself? Griffin, you're right. I am being mysterious, but I assure you it's for good reason. What I have to say will be disturbing, and I wish you no distress. I share your sight. When you draw and paint, I see what you're doing while you do it. I know your work almost as well as I know my own. Of course, I do not expect you to believe this without proof. Last week, while working on a head in chalk, 
you paused and lightly sketched a bird in the bottom corner of the paper. You then erased it and obliterated all trace with heavy black. Don't be alarmed. I wish you only well. Sabine. Yes, the pictures on the cards are mine. Sabine, this is impossible, and yet it must be true. There was no one in my studio all that week, let alone when I scribbled the bird. I've checked the drawing and there's not the slightest sign of the creature front or back. God knows how, but you really can see me, can't you? Why doesn't this alarm me as much as it should? I suppose because I've always sensed that I was being watched but I'd put it down to everyday paranoia. I have a million questions. Am I the only one you see? What form does your sight take? How come I can't see you? I want to hear everything, right, in detail. Tell me all about yourself. I demand to know. Please. Griffin. Griffin, now that he comes to answering your questions and telling you about myself, I feel oddly shy. Not that this is a reason to hold back, in fact, I deem it a sign to press on. I know nothing of my real parents. I was handed to my father and mother by an old picker who found me on the slopes of Pillow Mountain, bellowing among hot black metal and broken grass. My father, who was at the time the only European on the island, went with neighbors to search the area. But it was the rainy season. The mountain was deserted and one of the regular mudslides had obliterated everything. Later, he tried in vain to find record of a plane crash. But I had, it would seem, appeared from nowhere. I must have been six months old when I arrived. Hungry, but otherwise unharmed. In this way, I became Sabine, daughter of Gust and Tahi Strohem, and by the kindness and caring, have grown to my present age of 28 years. During my early childhood, I spent most of my time with my mother, who is a native of Katyn and Sigmund's only midwife. She is fun and wise, but by the age of seven, had grown bored with babies and birth. I decided to trade a company for that of my father, who had once been a curator at the Natural History Museum in Paris and had a mind that retained information like flypaper. He and I would go wandering in search of specimens for his catalogue of the islands, a book that would document every species on the Sigmonds. I'd skip along by the side of him, clutching his canvas bag and clinging to his every word. He loved to talk as much as I loved to listen. Sometimes it would be about Paris or Amsterdam or other cities he lived in, but mostly he spoke of the islands and the things we saw and heard. 
He encouraged me to draw those things, promising me the position of official illustrator to the catalog when I grew up. I remember one time when we'd just come up to the village from hunting shells on Polymy Beach and I dropped a monstrous conch on my foot. I howled with pain and a tree ahead of us exploded with blue and yellow mackles. My father, who could see that I didn't know whether to attend my toe or the feathered fireworks, laughed and whispered, pain and beauty are our constant bedfellows. Young as I was, I understood. On the dawn of my 15th year, I was lying in the easy state between sleep and wake, when the image of an half-drawn flower came into my head. I was entranced. Gradually it grew and changed. Lines appeared and disappeared. It was so real and clear. I could see the picture, but not the hand that created it. Eventually, a noise from the outside broke my concentration, and the image evaporated. It was your drawing, Griffin, the first of hundreds of pictures I witnessed without knowing who made them. For 13 years, I've waited for a clue, anything that would help me locate the artist. You seem destined to be an enigma forever, when a few months ago I came across an article in Grafica about a one-man postcard company. It said that the art was all Moss's own work and there was a photo of your first card. It was the same piece I'd seen being drawn three years before. Finally, I knew who you were. I counseled myself to be cautious and find out what you were like before revealing myself fully. Please don't feel invaded. It's not like that, I promise. But I am impatient to hear about you. Write soon. Yes, I can only see you. Sabine. Sabine, I am an honourable man, most of the time, and although I could spend this whole letter asking you more questions, I will hold back, do the right thing and spill my life story. But it's going to seem awfully dull compared to your colourful existence. I see what you mean about getting shy. I feel like climbing under the carpet. My mother was Italian-Irish, my father Hungarian-Scottish. I was born in Dublin, and when I was born, we moved to England. As you might guess, I wouldn't know my nationality if it came up and bit me. We lived off the Holloway Road in darkest London. Our small back-to-back -back Victorian house was as dismally predictable as the others in the row, at least from the outside. The inside was slightly different. Our house was a temple to the book. We owned thousands, nay millions of books. They lined the walls, filled the cupboards, and turned the floor into a maze far more complex than Hampton Courts. Books ruled our lives. They were our demigods. Occasionally, I'd come home to a reenactment of the Battle of Britain in the front room. My beloved parents would be flying round like a pair of demented fighter planes, shrieking and spitting venom at one another. My father would be wearing his traditional uniform of socks and moth-eaten dressing gown, and my mother her lemon carpet slippers and housecoat. My entrance would make no difference to their dogfight, but when one of them accidentally, and inevitably, knocked over a pile of books, they'd stop instantly and unite to examine the extent of the damage. 
life continued in this pleasant vein until the day my parents got run down by a newspaper van that thoughtlessly mounted the pavement in Islington High Street. It sounds heartless, but looking back, I would say that this was my great salvation because at 15, I was whisked off to live with my mother's stepsister in Totnes, Devon. Verica was a potter and the kindest person I've ever met. The first thing she asked me was whether I wanted to carry on with school or learn to pot. No one had ever asked me what I wanted to do before. I would have made her my idol if she'd let me. Instead, I became her apprentice. Some people find it hard to move from the big city to the country, but for me it was a piece of cake. Not only did I fall for Verica, but also for the town of Totnes. In that green and pleasant land, the cider is so strong you have to hold onto the bar as you drink it. I spent three blissful years in Verica's house being quietly instructed on how to use my hands and my eyes. Eventually she convinced me that I needed to broaden my skills and my horizons and packed me off to the Bristol Art College to become a fine artist. At college, everyone was painting big, flat canvases and becoming wizards with masking tape. To my discredit, I joined the geometric sheep when all I really wanted to do was become a cross between Leonardo and Rembrandt. I'm forgetting, you probably saw for yourself how dazzlingly dreary my stuff was. My spell at college wasn't totally wasted because I met Sarah, my first real girlfriend, and in the six months we were together, my horizons became broader. When I left Bristol, I returned to Topness, even though Verica by then had moved to the States. I'd only been back a couple of weeks when someone called to tell me that Verica had died suddenly of a brain tumour in New York. I stood in that cold little hall for ages, paralysed with loneliness. Losing my parents had barely touched me. They were only cartoon characters, but Verica was a real person. I didn't understand how she could leave me like that. If I'd grieved, I'd have probably been okay. Instead, I sunk into a dark, drowning depression and stayed there for almost three months. Remembering it now still makes me numb. It was a lawyer's letter that finally made me surface. Verica had left me her money and the combination of dealing with practicalities and realizing how much she cared for me forced me onto dry land. I came back to the world changed. I had an inner drum and I was going to march. I decided to use my inheritance to move back to London and set up Griffin Cards, which was to be dedicated to my idiosyncratic vision of the universe and that's where I am now, beavering away. I presume you can't see my writing as well as my pictures, or posting this letter would be superfluous. Any idea why it's only my images you see? And why can't I see yours? Tell me more about your islands, and tell me what you do. Did you become your dad's official illustrator? I can't express to you how pleased I am that you're out there. Since Verica died, I've been alone. Now that you're there and have been all along, I feel whole again. You don't think we're twins separated at birth, do you? Or is that too simple? Griffin. P.S. As you may have noticed, I'm not the world's greatest typist.
Griffin, can you imagine what it will be like never to see the back of your hand, then quite suddenly to turn it over and gaze at it? I read your letter again and again, nodding to myself as the events in your life match my memory of the way you were painting. When I read of Erica's death and your misery, I found it hard to breathe, and hearing that my existence eased your pain made my heart race. We have found one another, and I give thanks. Take care, Griffin. I will, I promise, tell you more of the island and my work when next I write. Sabine. Sabine, today I phoned the place in Dublin where they keep the records of births and deaths. My twin theory is blown. I was definitely a single birth. I also did a bit of research on telepathy. There was a man and his daughter in Argentina before the First War who supposedly could do identical drawings whilst miles apart. It sounds dubious to me, and anyway, I prefer to think of us as unique. Your pictures, the ones on the cards, seem very slightly familiar. Maybe I can see your work too, only my reception, as it were, isn't as good as yours. Winter's here early. The city is grey and dreary. I cheer myself by daydreaming of you and the South Seas. Love, Griffin. o'clock. I've been up for just under an hour. Below me, under my balcony, the street is starting to come to life. The sunlight is still soft and hasn't yet begun to cut its deep blue shadows across the kitchen wall behind me. I stay here drinking my coffee and writing for another few minutes. Then I'll go down to the boat that takes me across to Katyn. I work there three days a week. The rest of the time, I'm either here at my desk or over a keyhole, communing with some fascinating green sand beetles. You ask me if I became my father's illustrator. At first, yes. But then one day, around two years ago, he and I were halfway up a palm tree looking for mammoth eggs when he slipped. I slipped back down to find him unscathed but looking pensive. You know, he said, I would like to spend my remaining years with Tahi and the grandchildren. Would you like to take over and finish the book? I told him there was nothing in the world I would rather do. The book, of course, does not provide me with an income. The publisher's small advance is long gone. And although my parents would have supported me until I got married, as is the custom, I wanted to earn my own living. So when I was offered the grandly titled position of Sigmund's philatelic designer, I took it. The island elders had noted that the Solomon Island made a healthy profit by issuing stamps every couple of months to accommodate the world stamp collectors. They decided that we should do the same so my post as SPD came into existence. Each year, I designed 24 stamps. No one seemed to mind what's on them because I am the only one around who writes letters. The stamps are printed in Singapore and shipped straight out from there. The few that come back to the islands tend to sit in the post office gathering dust. I'm afraid this freedom of choice leads me to indulge myself in selecting subject matter.
Will you explain to me about those geometric paintings you did at art college? I want to understand their hidden language of color and shape. It's so alien to me. I wonder if we will ever understand how and why we are linked. Griffin, why try? Let us simply take pleasure in each other. I am of the islands, yet I'm from elsewhere. I've always craved a closeness till I could not find you. Now I feel it with you. My kinsmen are responsive to me, but there is no one to reach my heart. And you, who are so far away, have been closer to me than any man on the islands. It is evening now, and I have returned to the house. Outside is dark, and the birds are finally silent. But their place has been taken by the even noisier insect chorus. After dinner, I will lie down in my hammock in the hope that you are at work. I am never tired of watching those marks come and go. I remember your first erotic drawing. I was trembling from head to foot by the time you'd finished. Was that Sarah? No, no, don't answer. I'm only teasing. Why do I only see your images and not your writing? Because we dream in picture, not in words? You told me of your history, but speak little of the present. Why is that? Much care, Sabine. It's all very well for you to take this telepathic link between us matter-of-factly. You've had years to adjust to it. And no doubt your society teaches patience and acceptance. Mine teaches obsessive, logical inquiry. I'm just sticking to my programming. No, that's ungenerous of me. I promise to grit my teeth and try to allow things to unfold as they will. I'm kicking myself for not figuring out that you were the stamp designer. Looking back at the cards, it's obvious. When I saw the parrot postcard the first time, I assumed you copied it from the stamp. I apologize for grossly underestimating your talents. What a great job you have. You wouldn't care to swap, would you? Those college geometric paintings of mine had no hidden language to them. They were an example of what happens when you take an interesting concept through to its ultimate conclusion. It's meaningless. Forget about them. It embarrasses me to think of them. Art for art's sake is best quarantined here, in the old world. I crave an art that passionately transcends the mundane instead of being a device for self-deception. Enough. I'll tell you about myself, although I'm not certain what there is to say. I don't have any close friends. I keep my own company most evenings. I work in the studio. Maybe this isn't the best way to go about it. I'm making myself sound appallingly dull. I'll try again. Yesterday, I was in town, the centre of London, during the afternoon, talking with a card distributor. I didn't want to go back to the studio, so I shambled into the National Gallery. I reckoned I had ten minutes before the guards started slinging us out. When I've only got a short period of time like that, I pick a painting and try to dissolve myself into it. Without consciously making any decision, my feet took me to Paolo Uccello's George and the Dragon. Do you know it? I'd been standing in front of it for a while, my mind a vacuum, when I had one of those moments of profoundly shocking insight. There was my life laid out before me. I charge around on a toy white horse, lance in hand, wearing funny shining armor that wouldn't protect me from a cigarette lighter, let alone a dragon's breath. I attack these pet dragons in order to release beautiful maidens who will, I assume, reward me. They, however, are utterly indifferent. They don't care to be released 
and I've been fooling myself with a fake sense of purpose. Like George, my back is turned to an infinite sky filled with violent spirals of silver clouds. As you might guess, this revelation had something of a deflating effect on my mood. And I trailed out into Trafalgar Square, determined to take it out on the pigeons. But hounding the winged rats made me feel like St. George again. Defeated and utterly gloomy, I crawled onto a number 14 bus and headed home to South End Green. I tried to paint, but got nowhere. I put on some jazz, made myself a poached egg on toast, and gave myself over to self-pity. I'm making a joke of this, but I'm worried. Waves of depression are washing over me. I've started to see Verica in the crowds, and I feel like I'm slipping into my drowning pool. It's only your cards and letters that keep me going. I was finding it hard to get over the idea of there being other men in your life when I reached the part in your letter about my erotic drawings. I stopped being jealous. We were lovers, and I hadn't realized it. The drawings weren't of Sarah, they were of you. How strange to have a paper love. Make sure you look after yourself. All my love, Griffin. Griffin, I'd fail to understand how unhappy you are. You cover up with jokes and a front of being self-contained. I'm worried for you. Don't judge yourself so harshly. Why not get down from the white horse, take off the armor and walk away from the uninterested maidens? So you've been making love to me 10,000 miles away? How tantalizing. It accounts for the extreme potency of those drawings. I'll have to find a way to return the affection. Remember to be gentle with yourself. Sabine. Sabine, when you found me, I thought my loneliness had gone for good. I was kidding myself. I desperately desire your company. I haven't talked to anyone in three days. I was sure I was going to start seeing your pictures like you see mine. I've tried so hard. I've concentrated, I've meditated. I've done everything except stand on my head and I get nothing. Not a flicker. And I think my own work is going stale. I haven't produced anything worthwhile for weeks. And my stomach hurts. Pathetic, isn't it? Aren't I? Send me something from the islands. Some magic that will heal my ailing soul. How can I miss you this badly when we've never met? Love, Griffin.
Griffin, I miss you too. If you don't see my pictures, there is a good reason. Sometimes willpower alone cannot make things happen. As for your work being stale, I disagree. What I can see is not staleness, it's change. I feel you moving to your dark side. Give your shadow a chance to unveil itself. You said that Griffin Cards was dedicated to your perception of the universe. Then let the card reflect a night. Island magic works on island souls. You and I will heal each other. Sabine. Sabine, this place is wearing me down. I find it harder and harder to get up in the morning. I never used to be like this. I was always disgustingly bright as soon as my eyes opened. I've started to hate this city, this, this country, all these stupid fucking people. I almost got into a fight in a cafe yesterday. I was sick of being alternately ignored and abused by the waiter and waitress. I was overtaken by an anger like nothing I've ever experienced before. I started yelling and kicking chairs. I guess I finally snapped. My days are barren, but my nights are heady with you. I want to know what you look like. Will you send me a photograph? Or Griffin? Griffin, a photograph would not be possible. I offer myself in paint instead. It's so flattering. But that's our prerogative as artists, to record ourselves the way we wish. Why, my kindred spirit, are you prepared to settle for a postcard of my face? If you wish to see me, why not come here? What is there to stop you? You're clearly unhappy where you are. Come, Sabine. Sabine, things have become so difficult. I mustn't write again. This whole affair has gotten too intense, too real, Sabine. You don't exist. I invented you. You. The cards, the stamps, the islands. You are a figment of my imagination. I was lonely and I wanted a friend, but I'm almost out of control. I've started to think I'm in love with you. Before it takes me over, it has to stop. Goodbye. Griffin. Griffin, foolish man, you cannot turn me into a phantom because you are frightened. You do not dismiss a muse at whim. If you will not join me, then I shall come to you. Sabine.
best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. <laughs>